Good morning, everybody. My name is John Hamry. I'm the president here at CSIS, uh, and I want to say welcome to all of you. I, I said to uh, Minister Zabari that I couldn't imagine that we would ever be able to get anybody to come on a Friday in August. You know, I told him I think it was only Bill Gates and the late Michael Jackson that could have gotten an audience out here in Washington, but I think it's a testament to Minister Zabari's uh, just essential leadership role uh, in, in Iraq. This is a man who has steadily been at the heart of Iraq's uh, uh, developments these last 10 years. He has been leading the foreign policy for Iraq. He's a voice that's welcomed in Washington. People understand him, they trust him, they know him. He's a, you know, a friend, a real friend is somebody that doesn't tell you what you want to hear, he tells you what you need to hear. And this has been his consistent voice. Uh, and he's here now at a time to help us understand that this is a uh, very challenging time uh, in Iraq. And the conflict in Syria is having very negative implications for Iraq. We don't appreciate that. We don't understand that. And his, his visit with us is to help us understand what this ally, and I say that word quite intentionally, this ally is living through and what we need to try to do to help. And so I, I want to say thank you to the foreign minister for his leadership, not only in Iraq, but here in Washington. And so I would ask you with your applause, would you please welcome this remarkable statesman, Foreign Minister Zabar. Thank you, <coughs> Dr. Hammer. Thank you so much for your great introduction. And uh, thank you, Joan, also for inviting us to the CSIS. And with this distinguished crowd, I know many of you in person. I worked with some of you. We've dealt with you in the past. And I'm really honored to be <coughs> among you today on this Friday. I'm honored also this could be the last lecture here in this building. So I have the honor, let's say, to at the CSIS before it moves to its new building. This is another honorary thing. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> I'm here to offer a view uh, from Iraq and the region. Uh, and <coughs> being honest and frank with uh, you, Really, I'll devote most of my time to the question to Q&A, rather than giving you a ready-made piece of what you want to, to hear from me. I know many of you have many, many questions, serious questions about Iraq, its future, its interaction in the region, and whether Iraq has succeeded in the challenges or it has not. Uh, but uh, <coughs> let me start that much of what is uh, happening today now in the Middle East, in the Ramses Square today in Cairo, in the southern district of Beirut, or in Idlib, in Deir Zur, in, in Syria, or in Baghdad, <coughs> in terms of terrorist attacks, really they are in many ways interrelated. And uh, the challenges and the opportunities, the triumphs and the tragedies has been taking place in Iraq for the past decades. And Iraq was the first country in our region to make the transition from dictatorship to democracy. We know, <coughs> we know that the road is long and hard and has been very, very arduous, torturous, for us to make that transformation, but still worth taking. As the Arab Spring has shown, countries that are going through transitions are at risk of foreign intervention and domestic violence. In Iraq, we are confronting all these challenges and more, but we are also making progress towards stabilization, stabilizing our society, growing our economy, building our democracy, and developing good relations with all our neighbors. 10 years after the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, 
the better future that we seek is still a goal, not a given. But some conclusions are as clear as anything can be in our region and in these times. For all the suffering <coughs> we have endured, the people of Iraq and our neighbors are much better off now <coughs> than Saddam is gone. Iraqis are forever grateful to the sacrifices that the Americans have made in time, in treasures, and in blood. Iraqis, of course, have endured even greater losses. And as the recent attacks of terrorism have reminded us, our ordeal is not over. The Iraqi people and our government intend to redeem these losses by building a future worthy of our sacrifices. After decades of dictatorship, uh, three disastrous wars, international isolation, economic sanctions, the displacement of more than a million Iraqis and the deaths of tens of thousands more, including the latest victims of terrorism, Iraq <coughs> is embarking on building its economic future, democratic future, and building bridges within our society and with our neighbors. As Iraqis, <coughs> we, as we rebuild our country, Iraq and the United States will benefit by building a long-term partnership. Together, we can and must develop what President Obama has described, and I quote, as a normal relationship between sovereign nations and equal partnership based on mutual interest and mutual respect. With our political progress, our economic progress, and our diplomatic uh, progress, Iraq is taking its place as a partner for the United States, for our neighbors, and for the family of nations. On the political front, we are <coughs> building a multi-ethnic, multi-party democracy with respect to the rule of law. Our democratic process is moving forward at a strong and steady pace. Our local elections took place in April of this year. In Iraqi Kurdistan, there would be regional elections in September this year and our <coughs> legislative and general elections uh, will take place next spring 2014, which will determine our national leadership, and uh, that would be a very, very important day to watch. We have a government <coughs> of national unity. Now all the communities participate in the working of the government and of the parliament. Yes, we have differences of opinion, as all democracies do, but we are working together, and slowly but surely, our efforts are achieving results. We are promoting <coughs> human rights. There has been violations, which we admit, but there are constant efforts to improve on that and to be responsive to all calls, and also the freedom of expression and the advancements of women. There has been demonstrations and sit-ins in Iraq, in many provinces, in the western part of Iraq, in some uh, Sunni provinces in Iraq for the last eight months. And they have <coughs> cut roads, they have sit-ins, they have obstructions, but the government have not resorted to the same methods the Egyptian recently uh, used or deployed. Uh, to disperse the, the, <coughs> the demonstrators. All the political parties have accepted election as a method of power sharing and peaceful change. Iraqi want to decide <coughs> their own future with voting, not violence. On the economic front, <coughs> we are growing and diversifying. We have the world's fastest growing economy, expanding by 9.6% in 2011 and 10.5% in 2012, according to Bank of uh, America Merrill Lynch. 
We will grow by 8.2% this year, beating China for the third straight year. On the energy front, our oil production has increased by 50% since 2005. Iraq expects to increase oil production to 4.5 million barrels by the end of 2014 and 9 million barrels a day by 2020. As the International Energy Agency has reported, Iraq <coughs> is poised to double our output of oil by the decade of 2030s. We will emerge as the world's second largest energy exporter and we will ease a strained global oil market. In spite of this prog uh, progress, we have challenges that we are working to address. 90% of our economy depends on oil. Our employment rate is 11%. Our poverty line rate is 23% although there has been significant progress over the last few years in meeting the <coughs> development millennium goals set by the United Nations. In order to diversify our <coughs> economy beyond energy, Iraq is investing oil revenues in education and crucial development projects, including restoration of electricity power and rebuilding our transportation system. Our economy will benefit from our progress on the diplomatic front as well. Last month, the United Nations Security Council removed Iraq literally from Chapter 7 sanction regime, which imposed economic and other sanctions on Iraq after Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait 22 years ago this month. We are working with the International Monetary Fund, as well as the World Bank and the Arab League and the OIC and many other regional and international <coughs> organizations as a fully responsible member, again, of the international community. Now we are moving towards a market economy friendly to foreign investment. Americans can provide that what our nations need through investment and trade not charity and aid. We need the expertise on energy, technologies, engineering, design, constructions, and financial services. Iraq offers <coughs> Americans tremendous investments opportunities for American developing and servicing schools, bridges and highways, healthcare, water treatment, telecommunications, and much more. And this is what our agreement for the strategic framework agreement covers between Iraq and the United States. But make no mistake, nothing that, will, that we build together will endure unless we win our war against terrorism and the war to stabilize the country and ensure security for all the people of Iraq. We see the violence in Iraq and the terrible toll that it has taken daily. And we have heard about the threats that compelled your own country to close your missions, 22 missions in the Middle East and North Africa recently. Al-Qaeda is behind the terrorist attacks against America and Iraq. And a time when the United States is seeking allies against terrorism. We want to work with you against our common enemy. We understand what is at stake in this struggle. It is our fight for survival, and it is the core of our national and regional policy. We consider terrorism a threat to world peace, to regional peace, and to the security of our people. We are working in close cooperation with the international community and our neighboring countries to fight all sorts and every manifestations of terrorism, whatever its sources, whatever its intention, and wherever we find it. These terrorists are seeking to destabilize Iraq because they see our political, economic, and diplomatic progress as a threat 
to the desperation on which they, they feed. If Americans are <coughs> tempted to conclude that our concern with terrorism is only a justification for our failure and it is extreme, then think to yourself, how would you <coughs> respond if a terrorist organization were operating on your soil as Al-Qaeda or its affiliates is operating uh, on ours? Together with, <coughs> with the threats against American embassies, the violence on our soil is an example of why Al-Qaeda is still a threat to all of us. Just yesterday, they bombed five hospitals, not <coughs> police stations, not uh, uh, government building, no, five hospitals, and deliberately. We've also seen the attacks on the Eid, on the last day of an Eid, which cost many, many, <coughs> the life of many people. If America <coughs> takes its eye, if America takes its eyes off the Middle East, then there will be a resurgence of Al-Qaeda and all its affiliates and more menacing than ever we have seen. Our concerns with the consequences of <coughs> terrorists have <coughs> uh, at a terrorist heaven next door shape our views uh, about Syria. Uh, for Americans, Syria is more than 5,000 miles away. For us, Syria is right on our doorstep. Our border <coughs> with Syria is long and, and purse, and therefore we are deeply concerned about the ability of terrorists to use and to cross these borders. And just, <coughs> that is why we are participating in the search of a political solution in Syria that will reduce the violence, violence and diminish the role of the extremists. It's not easy, this political solution, as we see the balance of forces moving this way and another. But that is one of the viable options for the people of Syria. And only the Syrian people can decide and determine their future. Iraq was <coughs> at the table uh, during Geneva One talks, and in fact, the final communique that was produced by the meeting has a strong Iraqi input in, in even the language that was adopted by all the participants. Now there are new talks about resuming Geneva II, but according to what we have heard here in Washington and in New York, uh, this could only happen maybe in October or maybe later. And there are no fixed dates yet about that possibility. We in Iraq do support the legitimate aspirations of the Syrian people for <coughs> freedom, democracy, and self-determination. And Iraq has tried to, <coughs> to, to, to adopt uh, an independent, neutral position, not to side with one side against the other, but to seek and to support a peaceful, democratic solution in Syria. There is no sympathy whatsoever with the Ba'athist in Syria <coughs> at all, or with the Ba'athist regimes. In fact, at one time when we called the international community to hold the Syrian government responsible <coughs> for terrorist acts in, in Iraq, we were the only voice. And all our allies and friends abandoned us in that call. <coughs> Unfortunately, <coughs> There are some who have called for Iraqis to volunteer, to volunteer on both sides in Syria, and have used religious justifications on the basis of a sectarian confrontation. But let me be clear, the Iraqi volunteers who are fighting on either side in Syria do not represent the policy of the Iraqi government in any way. We are also opposed to the smuggling of arms from Iran to Syria. The government of Iraq is committed to implementing UN Security Council resolution
promoting peace in Syria and keeping with our position against the militarizations of the conflict, we are doing our utmost to prevent the shipments of arms across our borders or airspace by whoever. <clears throat> but we cannot do this without the capabilities and the sophisticated, uh, integrated <coughs> defense system uh, that we lack. And this is what we have been asking from our friends to help us. This is one more reason why the United States and Iraq need to deepen our partnership uh, and to combat terrorism. We need to continue to fully implement the strategic framework agreement that our countries <coughs> signed before the withdrawal of the American forces in 2011. That <coughs> means expedited delivery of promised military cells as well as assistance in counterterrorism and enhancing the capacity <coughs> and, and the, uh, uh, the capacity of our security forces, short of reintroducing American troops in, in Iraq. Nobody is calling for the redeployment of American forces, but under the strategic framework agreement, there is a great deal of room, of space for <coughs> security cooperations to enhance uh, our common fight against terrorism. Iraq is also in the process of purchasing over 10 billion worth of military equipment, from mainly from the United States and other countries. We are paying for it <coughs> with our own revenues, and we want to buy this hardware from the American allies. Our recent purchases of 30 Boeing planes for our national carrier testifies to our potential as a market for American companies, American products, and American services. The view <coughs> from Iraq and the region also include opportunities as well as challenges, as we have outlined. Over the past two years, relations between Iraq and Kuwait have improved enormously. In fact, there have been mutual visits between the two countries at the highest level. The problems of the past are being resolved through the Joint Ministerial Committee and the UN Security Council Resolution Number <coughs> 2105 on June 27 of this year. This included Iraq's compliance with our obligations toward Kuwait. The only remaining issues, <coughs> which is not a controversial issue because there has been mutual agreement and payment is the compensation which Iraq is doing. But my country is literally, is, is practically out of Chapter 7 and the, the sanction regime. Now we are focusing on the future relationship between our countries so that together <coughs> we can promote peace, stability, and security in the region. Considering how much has changed between Iraq and Kuwait, there is a new hope for our neighbors uh, throughout our region. We do not object to Iran having a peaceful civil nuclear power program, but we would be one of the first countries to object to Iran possessing nuclear weapons because of the past and because of the history. In fact, we favor the universalizations of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and strict adherence to all of its obligations, particularly in the tender box of the Middle East. Definitely, Iran needs to convince the international community that their program is only for peaceful purposes, and the world community needs to engage with Iran to address <coughs> the issues that have isolated it. We are encouraged by the election in Iran and the victory of President Rouhani and the selection of his new teams. And uh, Iraq has been uh, trying to be useful or to be helpful in, in reaching an understanding on these uh, very important issues. In order to reach diplomatic solutions to the crisis of the nuclear program, 
Iraq has worked in cooperation and coordination with the Islamic Republic of Iran and the European Union to host the meeting of the <coughs> 5 plus 1 group in Baghdad last May. Iraq will continue its efforts in the area in coordination and cooperation with the countries concerned. As the first nation in our neighborhood to abandon weapons of mass destruction, Iraq recently chaired an international conference in disarmament. Just imagine 20 years ago where we were. We seek a Middle East free of nuclear weapons. Towards that goal, we support efforts to convene a UN conference in Helsinki. Iraq seek <coughs> to forge friendship with our neighbors and a strategic partnership with the United States. Together, we can build a future of peace, prosperity, and democracy worthy of the struggles and sacrifices of Iraqis and Americans in our time, and the hopes and dreams of generations yet to come. I thank you very much. Thank you. Minister, thank you very much for that uh, statement. I think it's, it's a, a sign both of the complexity of your agenda and the skill with which you handle it. Uh, the minister has agreed to take questions. What I would ask is that you wait for a microphone and that you identify yourself uh, and that we only ask uh, one question until everybody has had a chance so that we can uh, work our way around this rather full room. So we'll start right here, if we may. Thank you, Mr. Alderman. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. My name is Saeed Erika. I'm a Palestinian journalist in town, but I also served in Iraq as a United Nations spokesman for five years. So I got to know it. Uh, Your Excellency, tell us what are the safeguards uh, that you are implementing now to ensure that Iraq does not slide back to the bad old days of 2005 through 2007, especially in light of the merging of Al-Qaeda, Iraq and Iraq, Al-Qaeda, Syria, and how would that figure into a new SOFA security agreement, so to speak, without introducing uh, troops on the ground, boots on the ground? Thank you. Uh, first, uh, I'm a believer, and uh, as a practitioner of Iraqi politics, not as a diplomat, uh, I personally don't believe Iraq is sliding into sectarian or civil war for a number of reasons. First, with all these attacks you have seen, the people have not responded, have not uh, been influenced at all by these deliberate attacks to ignite sectarian or civil war. You've all seen the reports uh, last uh, spring of troops massing up in the frontiers of Kurdistan or in the disputed uh, areas between uh, the federal government and the regional government, but uh, nothing happened and the problem was resolved peacefully. You've seen many people abandon the government in Iraq, the Kurds, the Sunnis, and others, but then through dialogue, through interaction, I think now everybody has rejoined the government uh, to work together. So uh, secondly, we've been there before in 2005, 6, 7, and we've seen uh, uh, how terrible that situation was when we were counting 100, 150 bodies in the streets of, of Baghdad and so on. Really, there is self-restraint by all the communities not to be dragged again into that. Although civil wars and other uh, phenomena actually does not happen by a decisions, by an incident or another incident, but we all followed how the surge worked in, in Iraq and how successfully uh, and still, actually, there is a great deal of, of expertise and benefit we are drawing from uh, these efforts. Uh, secondly, we, uh, politics has taken over in Iraq. 
I mean, most of the Iraqis, even who were opposed to the new Iraq or the new regime, are embracing democracy. They're all waiting for the next election to change their future. We have seen the recent <laughs> local elections, how the people have spoken everywhere. And they are waiting for the next elections in 2014. Uh, as I said before, really we have demonstrations, sit-ins in many parts of the country for the past eight months, and the government never resorted to the kind of, of violence except in one or two incidents in Hawija, and I'm not here to justify these violations whatsoever, but really generally the government has tolerated this uh, so far to go on without any, any intimidations. And the dialogue is, <coughs> is continuing. The other element and restraint is the religious establishment. Uh, the Shia religious establishment in Najaf and Karbala have stood very strongly against any <coughs> engagement in, in, in retaliations or responses. There are militias, there are <coughs> forces, actually extreme forces on both sides, but really they have not reached the level of uh, seeing the country dragged into a new civil or sectarian war. So uh, security-wise, it may not be stable, but it would be manageable until the next uh, year. Now, there is no plans, actually, to have a new SOFA. Uh, we have concluded the SOFA. It's done. It's over. We have another agreement, as <laughs> the Strategic Framework Agreement, that's a long term that defines Iraq-United States relations for many years to come. And under this, there are joint commissions on security, on diplomatic uh, political issues, on services, on energy, on cultural things. I have uh, attended the fifth meeting of the Joint Coordination Committee on Political and Diplomatic with Secretary Kerry yesterday at the State Department. So this is an indication that this is going on. But under the SFA, I think there is room for more security cooperation between Iraq and the United States. Uh, David Mack, uh, Middle East Institute an old, er, old hand at uh, U.S.-Iraqi diplomacy. Um, I want to salute what you've done in terms of reintegrating Iraq into the international community. I think future historians are going to rate you right there with the great French Foreign Minister Talleyrand in terms of what you've accomplished. Um, but, my, but my hard question for you is, what is the outlook for improving Iraq's somewhat troubled relations with two of your larger neighbors, both Turkey and Saudi Arabia. Thank you, David. I appreciate uh, one of the first uh, American diplomat in my career before becoming the foreign minister of Iraq was to meet David Mack at the State Department. And I remember that meeting very well in 1991, immediately after the Gulf War and the uprising and the exodus. So it's good to see you, David, and uh, a friend, and I have a great deal of respect. Uh, what you, your question is very important. We in the Iraqi government have been discussing this really very closely, that uh, let's, be f let's be honest about each other. There are two countries that have an influence over Iraqi Sunni communities, Saudi Arabia and Turkey, for different reasons. Uh, we have good relations with Iran, we have good relations with Jordan, with Egypt, with the Arab countries. And for your information, now in Iraq, we have nearly 92 or 93 diplomatic missions, including 15 Arab embassies. So those days of boycott <coughs> of Iraq, of uh, not accepting this alien body, are gone. Uh, even the Saudis have non-resident diplomatic representation. With Turkey, we've experienced many, many problems, and primarily because of the lack of respect by <coughs> the Turkish politicians or officials for dictating uh, on an elected Iraqi government what to do and not to do. I think now 
they realize and recognize that uh, there is another way to follow in fostering. Although Turkey is our largest trading partner, actually now we have uh, between 12, 14 billion of trade with Turkey. And they are, after the closure of Syria for their own goods and, and transit and so on, Iraq is the only viable route for them to the, to the GCC and to the Gulf. Uh, I'm planning to uh, meet with the Turkish official uh, soon, uh, maybe in Ankara or in Geneva for, for talks in order to improve that. With the Saudi also, we have not broken relations. We have communications and contacts. There are a number of things we can do to improve relations or to introduce some uh, confidence building measures. One of them, we have a treaty to exchange the prisoners. Uh, we have Iraqi prisoners in Saudi Arabia. The Saudis have some prisoners in Iraqi jails. Uh, almost we are at the final stages of concluding that. We are also considering some business uh, relations with Saudi Arabia through reopening the Ar'ar border point between Iraq and Saudi Arabia. Uh, David, uh, for your information, I was in Riyadh uh, a few months ago, and I discovered really that the Saudi trade with Iraq, not directly, but through Jordan and Kuwait, is nearly four billion U.S. dollar. And uh, also we need to lower the rhetoric, the sectarian rhetoric, really, and on, on both sides, I mean, uh, in many ways, in order to seek a viable, healthy, good relations. Our resolving of our problems with Kuwait have helped uh, with the Saudis and with the other GCC members. But I take your point, it is an important challenge for us, in fact, to work on that very seriously. Barbara Slavin from the Atlantic Council and almonitor.com. Uh, Minister Zabari, always a pleasure to see you wherever in Washington or in the region. I wanted to uh, get a little more detail about uh, your views on the new Iranian government and uh, what Iraq is prepared to do to try to facilitate uh, the nuclear talks. Were you in uh, Tehran for the inauguration of President Rouhani? Can you tell us something about your discussions uh, with them and what your sense is of how the U.S. is receiving the overtures from the new Iranian government. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Barbara. Uh, I believe that the elections of uh, President Hassan Rouhani was a statement by Iran and the Islamic Republic of Iran to the international community, to the world, that it means serious business. Uh, otherwise, uh, there are many ways uh, his uh, success or his uh, election could have been scuttled from the first round uh, to force it into a second round. But the pressures were enormous on the establishment to go along with, with, uh, with this uh, outcome. And also he has drawn a great deal of support from the reformist movement. Uh, Rouhani is a credible leader who is a member of, 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 of the regime. He is not uh, weak. He has very strong relations with, with uh, all, all the key leaders in, in Iran, Khamenei included, uh, Khatami, Rafsanjani, and others. So he's uh, a member of, of, uh, of the revolution. His, uh, his credential could not be challenged. Also, the statement we have heard uh, calling for moderations, calling for ending of Iran's uh, isolations and uh, the suffering that Iranian people are going through by the imposition of, of sanctions and political isolations, I think uh, were made very clear and loud. I wasn't in Iran, actually, during the inauguration, but uh, the vice president uh, was there uh, uh, Nechirvan Barzani, the KRG Prime Minister, was there also. So the feedback we have had that there would be a change, but this change could not come immediately, as many people expect. Uh, the key elements everybody would be watching is the 5 plus 1 uh, meeting in September, and whether the Iranian will come 
to present any new approach. I personally doubt that it will happen that soon, but the pressures are, are mounting definitely on them to seek uh, a solution. Uh, my message has been really not to underestimate this change in, in Iran, uh, but uh, we have to wait and see because the proof of the pudding is in eating, as they say. And, uh, but it is a positive change the way I, I, I see it. Mr. Minister, if I could just pick up on, on one part of Barbara's question. She also asked about whether Iraq sees any role helping to facilitate some change in the world's relations with Iran. Is that one of your ambitions? Yes. I believe Iraq could serve as a bridge uh, between the United States, the Security Council member, and Iran. And we have played that role in the past. Uh, and as I indicated in my speech, the hosting of uh, the nuclear talks in Baghdad last year was an indication that we have an interest here to help to facilitate, but not to be a bridge that we will fall under the pressure, let's say, on both sides, but to uh, communicate fairly and honestly. And we will continue to do that because we have a vested interest there. Uh, all the way in the back. Henri Baki, Lehigh University. Uh, Mr. Minister, you, in, no, in the Kurdish areas of Syria, you have now a fight between the Kurds and the Al-Qaeda. And the president of the KRG has said that he might use force, send the Peshmerga in to protect the Kurds. So what I'm trying to understand is what is the position of the Iraqi government to an attempt by a segment of Iraq sending forces across the border into Syria? Would that be part of your, uh, of your policy? And also, what do you think should happen in, with the Kur Syrian Kurds? Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Good to see you on Alan. Thank you. Uh, this is a good question again. Uh, in fact, uh, there has been fighting and tough fighting between al-Nusra uh, and some other Kataib, I don't know, Ahrar al-Sham, and many of the extremist groups uh, with, the, with the Kurdish or the uh, PYD party there, which is uh, in charge. And there has been some massacres reported by the killing of uh, hundreds of civilians uh, on ethnic base or on, on this. And this has uh, raised alarms, really, in the Kurdish community throughout the region, but also in the KRG, uh, to do something to defend or to protect the Kurds in, in Syria. But uh, these decisions really need to be coordinated. We've discussed it in, in Baghdad, and the Iraqi government, Prime Minister Maliki and the Iraqi government are fully aware uh, of uh, the tension in Syria and uh, the danger uh, of uh, al-Nusra, al-Qaeda nexus taking place across the border in Syria or to control out of space areas, let's say, in Syria to declare their uh, Islamic states. Uh, but I believe uh, what the President Barzani said, really he will ask the the, the newly formed Kurdish national committees to investigate this before making any decision. So it's not sending Peshmerga across the Tigris or, or the Syrian borders to fight uh, another war there. Still, it's early. We are not there. We, there has been discussions, I think, between the Syrian opposition recently to resolve this, this conflict. But uh, any decisions, I think, will be coordinated with the government of Iraq. It will not be unilateral by the KRG. All right, thank you. <coughs> Chris Aishan with CBS. Uh, I wonder if you could address specifically the threat from al-Qaeda in Iraq, in, in Iraq. Uh, I believe the numbers have gone from about five to ten suicide bombings a month up to about 30 a month. That's a big escalation. What do you attribute that escalation, and, and what is your government doing about it? Thank you. That, that is why we are here, basically, to seek uh, more help and support 
because uh, really the, the Al-Qaeda network and its affiliates is a real, a serious challenge, let's say, to the stability of, of Iraq and of the region. And also we see this uh, uh, mergence between Al-Qaeda in Iraq and, and Nusra Front in, in Syria and other affiliates groups. Uh, they are uh, flourishing in this uh, kind of, of circumstances. Uh, the United States has a vast experience in combating Al-Qaeda in Iraq and uh, its, its technology, its intelligence uh, uh, on, on Al-Qaeda, on their networks, on fighting them. I think uh, uh, in, in their counterterrorism technique, uh, we need to benefit from this expertise to forge uh, a better uh, relations uh, with with the United States uh, security forces to enhance our abilities and capabilities, really in terms of uh, weapons, equipments, technologies, because uh, uh, it's not it's not going to stop there. I think uh, uh, Al Qaeda, as such, we have our own failure as the Iraqi government. We have admitted them. We could do a better job, but really the challenge is beyond our capabilities. Minister, good to see you again. I'd like to follow up on this, Mark, this entire issue first. about, yeah, Mark Kimmett, I'm sorry, uh, on this issue of counterterrorism. You've identified it as probably the key issue inside of Iraq right now. It's what's brought you here to Washington, D.C yet you have preemptively taken off any option of U.S. military support, what you referred to as boots on the ground, which would necessitate a SOFA. Is that an Iraqi decision not to ask for American troop support to provide that expertise, or is that an American political decision placed upon you, or a combination of both? Uh, really, we are not short of boots on the ground. We have nearly one million under arms, and thanks to you and to the U.S. for helping to raise and, and train this. So it's not the number of, of, of uh, boots on the ground or, or American soldiers in Iraq. No, this is not the request for my government or to reintroduce U.S. troops in Iraq, in fact, and in numbers. But... Uh, as you know, the, uh, we have security cooperation with you uh, within the security office attached to the embassy in, in Baghdad. Under the strategic framework agreement, there is room for, to support, to enhance uh, Iraqi democracy and support uh, all the efforts. When we drafted, actually, or we agreed on that agreement, we were conscious that in the future we may need future assistance and help. So there are many ways, you as a military commander, you know that there are many ways the military could do to provide help uh, short of that, of sending troops uh, into Iraq. So it's not the request of my government, actually, and I don't think there is any appetite or willingness here also uh, to send troops abroad or to engage into another conflict now. Thank you very much. I'm Josh Rogan with Newsweek and the Daily Beast. Uh, thank you for your time today. Um, as you know, uh, as we discuss increased security cooperation, one of the main requests of the Iraqi government is for new U.S. arms sales to Iraq. Uh, lawmakers here in Washington are concerned about those sales for two reasons. They believe that Iraq is still allowing Iran to use Iraqi airspace to uh, promote the flow of arms to the Assad regime. Also, they're concerned that the Iraqi government may use uh, U.S. weapons uh, towards political ends to marginalize the political opposition, as we've seen in the past. What assurances can you give us uh, on both of these fronts? What specific takes, steps are you taking to stop the arms flow from Iran over Iraqi airspace to Assad? And what assurances can you get to give us that, uh, as we approach new elections, uh, that uh, U.S. weapons won't be used uh, for domestic political purposes? Thank you. 
Uh, definitely, my government will abide by all the rules, the, the regulations uh, you here in the United States or Congress will impose on all this arms sale, not only to Iraq, to many other countries in the, in the world. So we will abide by that, definitely, for these weapons not to be used for domestic use or, or uh, improperly. Uh, it would be used for the defense of, of the country. Uh, now, on the flight of uh, uh, the overflight of Iranian using Iraqi airspace, uh, let me uh, to give you the, the reality. I mean, sometimes we're talking theoretically about the situation as if Iraq has uh, uh, dozens of uh, uh, fighters or aircrafts. For your information, Iraq doesn't have a single fighter plane. Up to now, it has a couple of helicopters, some uh, uh, training, let's say, plane, small plane, but it doesn't have a single aircraft to protect its airspace. Iraq, up to now, doesn't have an integrated self defense to protect its skies. We have requested, we, we are waiting for the, for the delivery. So, that is the situation when we talk about Iraq's capability and deterrence capabilities to prevent others from using its uh, airspace and so on. Uh, we have made demarches to the Iranian. We don't want, we don't support you or any other to use our airspace because it runs against our policy of uh, taking an independent, neutral position here. Uh, not to militarize the conflict uh, in any way. And we have done a number of, of inspections. These inspections could not be, uh, uh, I mean, uh, endorsed by some circles here in the, in the United States that this could choose only those who, uh, who carry, let's say, legitimate uh, equipment or uh, material. Uh, but uh, we have raised the possibility here, really. I mean, uh, we will continue to live up to our commitments here. But there are Security Council resolutions banning this from leaving Iran, I mean, uh, under Chapter 7, whether it's weapons, import, exports. We don't have the capabilities of enforcing this. Yes, as politically, we've made these demarches. Uh, so who, who is going to reinforce that? Is it the Security Council or who? Uh, we've taken note, actually, of uh, the administration's serious concerns about this flight. I can tell you now they have gone down. Uh, they may have not stopped, but uh, believe me, we have no ways of, of making sure that what kind of weapons, equipment, it's not only Iran that is providing Syria by arms and ammunitions, Russia, other sources. Uh, it's very clear the Tartus port on the Mediterranean is, uh, is seen daily, let's say, by U.S. satellite and imagery, how much weapon is, is uh, gone into Syria. So here we don't want to see, to take or to view Iraq as a whipping boy, let's say, for failing to hold others to their commitment. Uh, and But we will live up to our commitment. I think we will do more, let's say, uh, to live up to our co commitment to stop, to prevent any further flights, uh, legitimate flights. Again, there is an international law case here, let's say, for, for this agreement and arrangements between countries and so on. But uh, we have taken note, let's say, of the administration position. Mr. Minister, I'd like to, uh, Phoebe Marr, an independent scholar on Iraq for a long time, I'd like to add my word of welcome and um, please come visit us more often. I do have a question. I'd like to get back uh, to oil. One of the things, as you know, that's inhibiting investment is the lack of a hydrocarbon law. Um, how close is Iraq really to achieving a hydrocarbon law? And please give us some sense of all these pipeline proposals we hear 
um, about to take place. The independent one from Kurdistan to Turkey, uh, the new one from Baghdad through Turkey, potential through Jordan. Um, what are we to make of those and how realistic are any of them? Thank you, Phoebe. It's good to see you here and still same spirit. Uh, and uh, the hydrocarbon law is one of the key political challenges for Iraq or for the new Iraq uh, on the basis of the Iraqi constitution that devolved power and wealth, let's say, among the region, among the people. And only recently, the Iraqi parliament passed a legislation to enhance the powers of, of, of the governorates, of the local authorities, let's say, in each governorate in, in Iraq. And uh, it has been a political issue between the KRG and, and Baghdad, really, this uh, hydrocarbon law. We had a version we agreed in 2007 that was accepted by both sides, but uh, it didn't materialize. Still, it is the key reference point. Uh, because of the deteriorations of uh, relations between the KRG and Baghdad, there has been a separation um, of, of thinking, of planning, of using the oil resources and approaches with, with Turkey <laughs> and Iran also, for your information. It's not just Turkey. Uh, but uh, really, I th I'm not uh, pessimistic and hopeless that uh, for finding a resolution of this, because it benefits the country, it benefits everybody, it uh, enhances uh, Iraqi oil industry, uh, this, the issue of ownership, the issue of, of, uh, of reliability, let's say, for other uh, oil investors to work in, in Iraq, it is very, very important subject, and it is a top issues in all the political meetings uh, between the, the key. But whether the, it, it could be enacted soon, I really, I don't want to give you any false impression. I believe this issue is one of, of the existential issues in, in the new Iraq. It has to be resolved with uh, partnership, with participation, with uh, genuine uh, resolutions of, of the key political issues that uh, are hindering Iraq. I personally believe there is a better atmosphere now. There's better communication. Uh, recently, after the exchange of visits by Prime Minister Maliki to Erbil and President Barzani to Baghdad, they have agreed to address this issue frankly and to form uh, a, a serious technical commissions to look at the issues. Uh, there is also related to the hydrocarbon law, the revenue sharing in, in the country as a whole, they are related. Uh, these two issues, I think it's do they are doable, but depends a great deal on the on the political understanding between the leaders. Yes, uh, the KRG is trying to enhance its position through opening up to Turkey. Turkey's relations with Baghdad are not at the best uh, <coughs> uh, stage, which is something we are trying that uh, normalizing relations between Ankara and Baghdad could benefit all, including the, the KRG. And uh, these pipelines, is, they are also controversial issues, to be honest with you. I mean, there is no agreement on, on them. And uh, we agreed that uh, soon, very soon, in Baghdad, there would be a meeting of these commissions to address the issue of the pipelines and to see whether we can do finalize the hydrocarbon law before the end of this year or be left until next year elections, which most likely it would be. Then back on the left, this will be the last question. Yeah, exactly. Hi, Wallace Hayes, independent consultant. And I wanted to give you an opportunity. A lot of people here feel like uh, there's been a lack of political reconciliation in Iraq and that it was, it's been U.S. policy to support the Erbil Agreement, which has not been implemented in Iraq. 
And I think following up on Mr. Rogan's question, why should, I'd like to give you the opportunity to, to explain why should the United States sell arms to Iraq when in fact many people believe the lack of political reconciliation is contributing to some of the violence today? Thanks. Thank you. Political reconciliation is the key issue, really, for Iraq, for the stability of, of Iraq. And I think uh, all the key leaders believe that this is the way forward. Uh, with the hydrocarbon law, with normalizing relations with Saudi Arabia, with Turkey, I mean, all the questions have been appointed questions about the, the core issue in, in Iraq. So. Uh, the political reconciliation is, is moving, is not stagnant, really. I mean, uh, look at the, of the representatives of the Sunni community, let's say, or from al Iraqi uh, parliamentary blocs. Now they are represented in the parliament, they are represented in government. They may feel they are underrepresented or marginalized. This is a fair uh, call. I mean, we could do more about that, definitely. But uh, really, the lessons that came out of this local election was very, very important. Many people believe they could do with the majoritarian democracy or political majority government that the one sect or one group can win all over and run by themselves. Uh, it proved they couldn't. They could win, but they could not govern. And I think everybody realized and recognized that there has to be an inclusive democracy, non-sectarian democracy in Iraq for this country to have any future. Mr. Minister, um, I've heard a lot of foreign ministers speak. I don't think any has a more complex agenda, and I don't think anyone handles it as well as you've demonstrated you handle it today. I'm also a little bit humbled by the fact that I think you have more friends in Washington than uh, I do, <laughs> and I live here. We haven't. They? So thank you very much for honoring us today. We look forward to welcoming you in our new building. Thank you.